Welcome again everybody and thank you for joining our global webinar day on best practices and live demonstration on NCCM with InfoSim StableNet. My name is Dietmar Kneidel with InfoSim and I will be your moderator for today's event. Our presenter is my colleague John Olson, VP Technical Services Americas. Good morning John. Good morning, Dimar. Um, and I'm, I'm asking for a good morning. I'm saying good morning because it is morning at your end. It's afternoon here in Europe, but you're joining us from uh, the Americas, so it is your morning. So, hope you've had some coffee already. I have. Thank okay. You. Excellent. So we can we can expect an an excellent guide through the presentation. Uh, before I hand over to John, just a couple of household items. I wanted today's audience to know that all of you are automatically muted just to keep down the background noise. So in order for us to answer your questions, you will have to type them in the questions or chat window at the bottom of the GoToMeeting application. John will be answering all questions right after the presentation in our Q&A session, but uh, if you have any questions during our session, please feel free to ask them. Don't hold back until the end. Um, if we can answer those questions uh, during the presentation, we of course will. Also, please take note that this event is being recorded and all registrants will be notified via email uh, uh, tomorrow on how to access uh, that recording. I guess that's all from my end, uh, so I'd like to go ahead, turn things over to our presenter, John Olson. John, you ready? I am. Thank you, Dietmar, and thank you, everyone, for attending, taking the time out of your day to uh, watch this webinar this afternoon, uh, Best Practices and Live Demo uh, on NCCM with StableNet. We'll jump right in and get started. We do have uh, a couple of, of introductory slides for those of you who are not familiar with our company or our product. Uh, InfoSim, we are a manufacturer of uh, software manufacturer of automated service fulfillment, service assurance uh, products. Uh, we have a single product called StableNet. Comes in two versions: StableNet Enterprise and StableNet Telco. And that gives a bit of a, uh, an indication as to the type of customers that we typically have. They, uh, we focus on larger organizations, larger enterprises, uh, telcos, carriers, service providers, that sort of thing. Uh, we've been in the market for 11 years now, since 2003, developing, again, this single product, StableNet, uh, which really is a unified platform for fault performance and configuration management. So it's one product that can do all of that. Today we're focusing on one particular aspect, configuration management, but as you'll see as I go through the presentation, really even though that's the focus, it does uh, play well with the other parts of the product and they sort of integrate uh, together and, and uh, help each other out in certain ways. We are a global company headquartered in Germany, where Dietmar is speaking to you from. I'm, of course, in the United States. Uh, we have offices in the UK and in Singapore uh, as well. Uh, again, we, uh, we really do, we sort of break up what we do uh, into three major categories, config, performance, and fault management. That's probably not the only way to look at the product. Um, and in fact, we, we really do pride ourselves in being a unified platform. But it does help to sort of uh, introduce how we do things and, and why we do things and, and so having those three modules, if you will, in the back of your mind as we go through the presentation I think is useful. Um, but it is important to note and one of our major strengths as a solution is that we are a unified platform and what I mean by that is we have developed StableNet from the ground up over these 11 years without uh, uh, any acquisitions of other technology or companies uh, have not been acquired by anyone else. So truly what you're getting is a single platform, uh, a very unified and comprehensive platform and, and that would be in direct opposition I think to most of the other if not all of the other major competitors in our space that really are an amalgamation of a number of different platforms, a number of different technologies uh, that they are all sort of bolted together to try and create one quote unquote integrated platform, but we have none of those integration uh, problems or issues to think about because it has been developed, as I said, uh, from the beginning as one unified solution. 
And because of that, uh, we have a number of advantages. One of them is scalability, which is certainly important to us considering the market we play in, as I mentioned. And uh, nothing gets added to the product that impacts scalability. So if you're on this call and you're thinking, wow, I have a pretty large organization, can they handle me? Well, I, I certainly think that we can. Uh, and we have proven that we can. And we have proven that, especially in those large organizations, we have uh, a great story around return on investment in months, not years. And we have lots of stories that we can talk about, and, and I'm sure at the end, Dietmar will uh, give you an indication as to how you can get some information and some proven um, case studies uh, to, uh, to just that fact. One of the things that we're very proud of is a very recently released uh, survey. Dietmar, I'm sure you'd like to talk more about that. Oh, yeah, this is my new favorite slide. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, not only recently, it actually happened today. Uh, the Enterprise Management Associates, the EMA, has published uh, their most recent study today on, uh, and I'll just say this once and then use the abbreviation, on uh, Enterprise Network Availability Monitoring Systems. And I'm sure we all agree that ENAMS is uh, a new abbreviation, but much easier to say than the other one. And, uh, well, guess what? If you're looking for Infosum, we're the company in the upper right corner. Thank you, John. Uh, so we've been rated as a value leader in uh, that radar published today. Uh, we've got uh, very high scores in uh, solution impact, especially what John just mentioned around scalability and deployment cost efficiency. And uh, among a couple of other things, uh, the study has, well, more or less laid out that we're benefiting, benefiting from, from the fact that, you know, the underlying architecture has been designed um, to be deployable not only in enterprise, but also in, in large and really large telco uh, environment, environments. So uh, that paged a, a really a big uh, dividend in, in terms of scalability and flexibility. And uh, we've also received um, in a uh, study of 17 products from 16 different vendors, uh, which the EMA study was, the highest overall score for total breadth of features, uh, especially in uh, the areas of discovery and alarm correlation. So as you might have guessed by now, we're very proud of that uh, result, actually. So back to you, John. <laughs> Thank you. We certainly are proud of that result, and I think, uh, as this next slide will attest to, although we may not be a household name where you are, we certainly have quite a large and prestigious list of customers. You can take a look at the uh, logos in the background here in the various uh, or various verticals, although we don't specifically focus on any verticals other than the telco. Um, everything else is kind of together, uh, but we clearly have been in the market for a while, have developed great relationships with those customers, and I think the, uh, the uh, customer list on the background here is really a testimony to how well uh, we've done. So getting into uh, the presentation today, specifically network uh, configuration and change management, or NCCM, uh, I wanted to start with a slide that kind of sets the stage for why this is something you should be interested in. Um, hopefully everybody is already interested in it, but if you are joining and thinking, you know, what am I going to get out of this? Some of the, uh, this, especially the first two bullet points here, really I think point to the use case or the needs for an automated NCCM solution, and it's primarily around issues, outages, problems, uh, down services, and the cause of those, and, and both Gartner and EMA and many others um, have clearly indicated that in their research, the primary cause of mission critical uh, outages uh, in the past and in the future is uh, a lack of control from an NCCM perspective, meaning that configurations are changed or haven't been implemented properly and that either breaks the system or introduces vulnerabilities into the system or uh, compliance issues into the system that should not have happened and could have been alleviated if there was uh, a system in place to, to sort of watch out for those things. Today's networks are just too large, too complex, too changing, uh, and changing too rapidly for any human or group of humans really to, to take control over it uh, and do it sort of at, at a 
in a piecemeal basis. There has to be some sort of automated procedure in place to take care of a lot of the things we're going to talk about uh, in order to, to keep the networks up and running. And so StableNet uh, and our NCCM module has been designed to really alleviate these concern to concerns to prevent these outages and to help get your arms around the entire estate. So the way we're going to approach this today is through a list of best practices. These are uh, both from our research and from independent research. These are the things that we've identified that, that need to be put in place or should be put in place as best practices in any large organization that's concerned about NCCM. And of course, how StableNet addresses those concerns uh, and a live demo sort of uh, as we go through here actually showing how the product does those things. So uh, best practice number one, it seems obvious, although uh, Believe it or not, many people that I talk to in my uh, daily work with our prospects show that there's quite a few people that don't have best practice number one in place, which is backups, uh, and especially an auto discovery of their estate and then immediate auto configuration backup. Of course, people have been backing up servers and other critical file systems for years and years, but amazingly, a number of even very large organizations are not backing up, or not backing up in an automated way, their device configuration switches, routers, firewalls, and so on. Um, there's a, quite a bit of that still being done manually, copy, paste, keep it in a text file, something like that. But of course, that's not the best way to do it. Using a procedure, an automated procedure, is the best way to do it. And um, StableNet addresses that by building in that capability into our NCCM module. It starts with device discovery, which gives us, uh, of course, an indication as to what exists, how it's connected uh, to other devices, uh, what uh, physical platforms exist, what operating systems, how much memory, all of those things which become really important when you go to um, run the other things within NCCM which is uh, configuration pushes, which is uh, policy checks, vulnerability checks, lifecycle checks. You can't do those things unless you really know what you've got because how can you check against it, right? So the first thing is auto discovery and configuration backup and, and we'll go into the product in a few moments and, and take a look at how that's done, but it's critically important. And it really plays into number two, uh, best practice, which is automated alerting, essentially knowing when the backups are uh, not successful uh, or the discovery is not successful. Uh, you should be alerted to the fact that there's some communication issue, whether it's a password or some other failure uh, in the protocol, and you aren't able, to, or the system is not able to get access to those devices for backup. That could certainly be an indicator of another behind the scenes issue, but it also means you don't have the most recent backup. And therefore, if there is a problem, if you needed to restore or recover somehow, you wouldn't have that backup. The nice thing about the way Stable Networks is we already have a complete fault management system in place as part of everything else that we do, which handles the alerting uh, in, a, in a very uh, comprehensive format, right? So this is not like just trying to build in a simple email alert um, into an NCCM platform. We've got an entire module dedicated to fault monitoring, alerting, alarming, escalation, and so on, maintenance windows, everything that you need to really control those alerts. So because, again, because of that unified platform, I think you get a bit of a benefit uh, from the other components just directly within the NCCM piece. And of course, you need to schedule these things. Best practice number three is not just doing those backups once or twice, but having a repeatable automated procedure for doing that backup scheduling. Um, kind of takes place in two ways. You have a standard schedule, most typically something like once a day, uh, where everything is backed up, but then you also need the capability of triggering a, a specialized backup or a one-off backup, if you will, of those devices uh, and a rediscovery of those devices if something has changed during the day, let's say prior to the scheduled backup. Uh, it could be important uh, if something has changed at 10 o'clock in the morning to have that immediate backup and not wait until the end of the day or overnight to the next day to get that backup. And so we can handle that by being a log or message receiver, syslogs, traps, and so on, 
those uh, messages can give us an indication that something has changed on the device, whether it's a physical change or configuration change. And therefore, that should trigger us to perform an action, like an automated discovery, a new backup, etc. And again, the fact that we are naturally a syslog and trap receiver in our fault uh, area and to some degree even in our performance area means that we've already got all of that sort of capability built in. This didn't have to be rebuilt just for MCCM. It just needed to be extended. And again, you get that sort of uh, benefit of the unified platform. So taking all of those things into consideration, just a mere discovery uh, so you have a good understanding of what exists, and then uh, moving forward with an automated backup procedure and all of the things that go around the, the ability to do backups, uh, which is not just a, the, for example, the running configuration, but also potentially what we call device info commands or think of them as show commands. Um, allows you to really have a good handle on exactly what you've got. That's the first step, right? So um, I'll quickly jump over into our live uh, demo of the product. I'm in our administrative GUI right now uh, where you can do everything. We'll be focusing on just a few aspects, but just within this single uh, pane of glass, you can go into all of the performance measurements, all of the uh, configuration, the inventory reporting, etc. Uh, I've got a little uh, lab environment running uh, in Germany, actually, and so we've got a number of devices. I can uh, select any of those devices and look at the device information. So this is that discovery piece, the automated discovery. We do our own discovery. We don't rely on anyone else to provide this information to us. Uh, we pull in all of the information that you can imagine about a device. Of course, IP addresses, MAC addresses, names, operating systems, physical models, uh, deep OS detail information, uh, information about services or other Q, things like QoS policies, routing uh, that's been set up, VLANs, of course, physical modules and submodules with their individual characteristics of serial numbers or firmware or what have you. Of course, uh, interface information, speeds and feeds and IPs and Macs there as well. So just gathering that information initially is critically important because, if, again, later on, if you go to push a configuration and you want to push a configuration to all of your 3600s running iOS 12.419b, you need to know which ones have those. Uh, and so having that discovery in that repository directly on the product and not relying on an outside query to get it is, is really nice and really important. Then. Uh, moving into the specialized device automation uh, theme, as we call it, and with the multiple areas, uh, you can see I'm in the backup area. This is the result of a backup. Um, it's a simple view uh, uh, of the iOS config in this case, but it could also be uh, different uh, products. I've got you know Linux servers here, and I can go in and pull information directly out of a particular file. I've got an Ixia Anui system here, and I can see their backup. So we're we're very vendor agnostic. Uh, we support a very large list of vendors. I think that vendor list can be downloaded uh, from either our website or or provided to you. Uh, from your, our sales staff if you're interested. But um, in general, we're a very vendor agnostic platform. We can capture those backups from a variety of systems. I can see them directly on the screen. I can do things like do a very quick configuration differential. So I want to see the difference between April 10th and today, let's say. And of course, you can see it's very easy to read. It's very color-coded, something that wasn't there, something that is there now. I see another one of these blue lines. I click on it. It drops me right down into that area. I can see it. We would likewise show something that was there and is gone. That would be red in, in uh, that case, or things that have changed, right? So we still have the message of the day banner lines, but the, the banner has changed in some way. So you can uh, do these config diffs among the devices themselves or you know multiple uh, backups on the same device or multiple or backups between devices. Um, we've also got the results, as I said earlier, of things like show commands. So I can do a show dyad and I can store all of those results and I can do the same config diff there as well. 
Uh, so depending what, on what's important for your particular vendors or devices or systems, you can pull these additional informational commands. You can use those commands later to do things like policy checks and reports and so on, uh, as well as this, the uh, immediately stored uh, backup. And we also always show the startup difference, if there is one, between the uh, running config and the startup config. That's a very important thing. So we've got a few systems set up here to, to have differences in them uh, to, to show that as well. Uh, and of course, all of these things can be reported to you outside of the system on an ad hoc basis or on a daily or weekly or monthly or whatever schedule you'd like report that kind of shows, hey, everything that was changed yesterday to these devices or this group and so on. So um, really uh, a quick demonstration, there's quite a bit more behind the scenes, but that was a quick demonstration of uh, the first three best practices that we mentioned. John, I have a question from okay. one of our uh, attendees. Um, actually, a really interesting and tricky question. Um, so Good, I'll let you handle it. Ah, yeah, right, thank you. <laughs> I'll read it, I'll do the reading, and you do the answering. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, so if we have a device in, in our infrastructure that was discovered and a backup was scheduled, and the IP address of that device will be updated, so the device will be stated as down, um, is there a way not to lose the time until the device will be rediscovered with the new IP? That's a tricky question, I know that. Is there a time, sorry, read the last part of that, that again. Is there okay. a... So if you, I'll read it again uh, as, yeah. as a whole. Okay. So when a device in the infrastructure was discovered and a backup was scheduled and the IP address of said device will be updated, so the device will then be stated as down, is there a way not to lose the time until the device will be rediscovered with the new IP? Not to lose the time until the device will be rediscovered. So I'm not sure I totally understand that. I, I apologize what the question is. But I think what they're getting at is um, the new the, a device is changing its IP address. We don't want to lose the ability to talk to that device until it's been re-IP'd. We do store those um, configurations or the... the uh, both uh, from a backup perspective and from a device perspective. Um, uh, and we don't automatically delete it, let's say, if we go to discover an IP address uh, that's not, that was there previously but is not responding right now. It's not like we just forget about that device and delete everything. We do store that and keep it. Um, for historical reporting purposes and for just what you described, maybe something's being changed. Uh, you will notice in the uh, GUI that that device uh, will have like brackets around it, so it'll show that it doesn't exist currently, but it's not like it's going to be completely deleted. So I hope I hope that answered the question. I I think, I think it did. Um, if not, I'm gonna I'm gonna come with up uh, with that message again. I'm gonna haunt you. That's fine. <laughs> All right, now it answered the question. Thank you. Yeah, great. Okay, good. So moving forward um, into best practice number four, and actually the next few best practices are all really related to what we call policy checking. So policy checking is critically important, especially in large organizations, for a multitude of reasons. One of them is regulatory compliance, right? So we see lots of customers that are under the thumb, if you will, of multiple regulations. They may be a government uh, organization related to healthcare and they have certain privacy regulations. Um, it could be a financial institution that has a payment card industry or PCI regulations um, or whatever it may be. We often talk to people who are being audited or have regular audits. They even have an entire compliance department. And of course, everything from servers, PCs, phones, they all have to be under compliance, but so do the network devices. And uh, our customers are often in charge of proving that their devices, switches, routers, firewalls, access points, whatever it may be, um, meet the compliance regulations uh, uh, and have to uh, therefore satisfy their either their own internal compliance staff or an external auditing staff, what have you. So we have a we built a, a policy checking engine that allows you to do just that. Those policies that are checked 
uh, can be completely controlled by you. Uh, we ship with a number of default policies to help get you started, but uh, really any kind of policy uh, that is important to your organization can be built within StableNet, and all of your devices, including both the uh, iOS configs or the, the internal configs, as well as those device info commands, again, like a show command, you can check those against the policy as well, because sometimes that's the best place to get the information. So best practice number four is, is having a procedure, having a system in place that can regularly check against your regulatory compliance policies. And of course, StableNet can do that, and therefore you can very easily walk back into the compliance officer or the auditor and say, yep, here you go, this is what I do, this is StableNet, it runs every day, and here's the proof that everything is under compliance. That's certainly very nice. Um, in addition to the sort of uh, oversight or regulatory compliance, there's probably some internal compliance uh, or, or policies that you also want to check for that might be unique to your organization. Uh, there's also, uh, as new devices are rolled out, uh, every device has some sort of standard or default policy uh, enabled on it, and typically those policies are not the best from a security perspective or other perspective um, and need to be changed. Uh, many times they can only be changed if they're explicitly changed, so it's not even something that shows up if you were to run a backup. Um, it's sort of a, 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 a predefined setup that just stays that way until it's changed. So one of the best practices, our best practice number five, is to check for those vendor default policies that you don't want uh, to have anymore. And uh, things like changing the, S the default SNMP community string or uh, uh, disabling certain types of access, whatever it may be. Um, and it's, it's a recommendation that you create policies to scan the configurations of those devices and eradicate those potential holes. Um, really, uh, it's interesting how many people don't necessarily do that. They, they put on things like access lists, which is great, but they don't necessarily turn off things that have been left on by default. So there's vendor default policies uh, is something uh, that I think is really useful to have in the back of your mind at all times. And of course, that leads into best practice number six, which is all about security and, and access policies. Um, again, even outside of the regulatory compliance issues, there are internal compliance issues that we talk to customers have all the time. They usually have a policy written down someplace, and that can be translated into a, an electronic policy, if you will, in StableNet. Um, and most of those, or certainly the first step, is always around security and access. Uh, authentication, authorization, and so on, using back-end systems, radius, tac uh, what have you, of course, uh, uh, ACLs uh, involved that should be distributed out to all of those devices. Um, it's incredibly important that those uh, configuration of elements have consistency across the managed estate. And again, if we're talking about an estate that's thousands of devices or tens of thousands of devices uh, large, it would be impossible to really manually try and uh, comprehend all of that and uh, stay on top of all of that. <clears throat> Excuse me, you must have uh, a system in place to do that, and StableNet certainly has the capability to do that. And then lastly, we see even sort of one step above kind of the the configuration or the, the behind-the-scenes access and things like that, really service design policies. So think of uh, one of the, the best examples of that, I think, are QoS uh, markings on an interface, right, or, or set up on an interface. You, you need to have consistency across any device. Any new device that's put on must have the same or should have, certainly have the same QoS settings for those enhanced service offerings as that comes online. If you don't, then you run the risk of, of course, not having a consistent QoS policy, which can lead to all kinds of problems and service issues. And so as things are being added or as systems are being changed or adjusted or moved or what have you, just being, just knowing that every day or however often you have it set up to go, things are being checked to ensure that the configuration, the service, 
is designed and implemented the way it should be is obviously a great peace of mind uh, for any architect or you know uh, frontline engineer that's that's uh, in charge of, of setting this kind of stuff up and making sure that it works. You don't have to sit there and, and log into every system and read the config and compare it in your brain to what you think it should be. That's all taken care of for you through StableNet. So. Um, so probably another good time to pause. I'm going to jump into the uh, uh, GUI again and just kind of run us through a bit of how we do policy checking. Um, we run policy check through jobs. Uh, jobs is essentially a scheduled uh, procedure. It has a time, you know, uh, activation related to it, an interval related to it, it can, and it can have um, authorization related to it. So before this can this can run, uh, someone has to approve it, and so on. But behind the scenes, what's really happening is we're using something that we call snippets, and snippets are a, uh, a line or multiple lines of code uh, that we're trying to find or multiple lines of information that we're looking for to see if they exist or maybe don't exist within the config of the device or in one of those device info commands, etc. And sometimes they can be very, very simple. You could have something like um, uh, an authentication mode or uh, default ACL that needs to be put in place. That's not an ACL, so that's a bad example. Let's look at AAA, perhaps. And you could say I've got you know a line or multiple lines about how AAA should be um, set up. And so I'm looking for that. I'm looking for these uh, snippets within a configuration. I've got lots of very um, uh, detailed information behind the scenes uh, that uh, can be used to determine how this snippet should be applied against the running configuration or whatever I'm applying it against. And maybe it has to be in a particular section. Maybe uh, it has to be in a very strict order. Uh, maybe I can let it be a little more loose where things can be out of order or have carriage returns. Uh, I can use regular expressions as well as plain text so I can get very creative with those regexes to exactly identify what I'm looking for. Um, and I can filter against certain devices. I don't want to run you know, this against everything. I only want to run it against certain kinds of devices or types of devices or vendors or, or uh, model numbers or things like that. So you can use the filter uh, at the bottom to, to look at all of that. Ultimately, what you get is a comprehensive, the snippet seems, sounds almost like a small thing, but it's really a big thing that can be used uh, in a policy uh, and applied against those configurations. And many times, in fact, what you might have is a single policy. So for example, here's a single policy related to router access security, but that single policy is actually made up behind the scenes of a number of different snippets. So there's whatever, 15, 20 snippets involved here, each having their own options, each having their own regular expressions uh, or whatever it may be um, that uh, enable or you know, uh, create the overall policy. I can see exactly what it looks like um, and what, it, what I'm doing with it. And uh, ultimately, I can uh, uh, use those regular expressions, combine all of them into a policy, and run that policy against something. When I do run it against, for example, a backup, uh, and I'll go back up to one of these backups, and I just merely open that backup, I can get a quick visual indication uh, as soon as this is done loading. You'll see that I've, I'm trying to see what policies have been applied and what the result of those have been. We even color code them for you uh, so you can see which lines have been checked. Uh, what the result has been, obviously green is good, red is bad, and, and in more detail I can go behind the scenes and look at every single uh, uh, snippet that's been applied. I can see whether or not I'm in compliance or out of compliance. We can assign a severity to the snippet, so some are very critical, some are just more minor. I can see what the content of the line was, what the expected content of the line was, uh, and therefore whether or not I am in compliance or not. Of course, all of these things can be rolled up into reports that can be generated and typically are, so although I'm looking at this in an ad hoc basis, I could say 
you know, show me a compliancy report for the last 24 hours, how many devices were checked, what the result was, you know, uh, uh, filtered by severity or something like that. And you could get exactly the kind of uh, higher level, maybe even dashboard or management type uh, reports for those compliance uh, audits uh, that, you, uh, that you require. So by using this concept of snippets, these individual sort of uh, views, running them all up in or rolling them all up into a policy and applying that policy to the various systems uh, within the organization allows you to keep control over those regulatory issues, uh, the uh, security issues, the internal policies that we talked about already, et cetera. So uh, back to the presentation here, moving forward to the next uh, sort of group of best practices. Number eight is enabling real-time configuration change detection. I mentioned this briefly earlier, but just to get into a little more detail, we're talking about being notified when a configuration change has been made and then automatically doing something about it. So again, taking a log message or some other message from the device and then triggering a new backup, triggering a new policy check, triggering a new uh, discovery perhaps, whatever you want to do when you see a change because although you may have been in compliance this morning, somebody makes a change and then they've actually removed that compliance you would want to know about that right away. You don't want to wait. So. It's a very, uh, it's a very, uh, I think, important best practice to enable that sort of automated detection and not just wait for uh, the sort of standard job schedule to run. Uh, the being able to uh, do the change and compare, as I mentioned earlier and actually showed when I was in the demo, uh, being able to uh, compare configurations from previous known states very quickly. We can also run reports uh, that show anything. So a common report that I'll set up for a client would be a, da a daily report to show me all the changes that were made on any devices yesterday, who made them, what the changes were, et cetera. Uh, just a, it's a quick little scan. Uh, people can say, oh, there were 25 changes made yesterday. That matches with uh, whatever maybe other system I've got, ticket system or something, that, where those changes are tracked, and so we're all good. Or maybe I see something that I'm not a little concerned about, and I want to check it out and see why it was done or who did it, uh, et cetera. So having that behind the scenes sort of audit trail of everything that was done is, is, is certainly important. Moving forward to the last couple of best practices, um, the right in the name, of course, NCCM is change in configuration management. So many times what people want to do is roll out large scale changes. I need to add an, an access list line to 400 routers right now. Um, obviously, that's a that's a very would be a very time consuming and probably error prone procedure if it was done manually. Um, it's incredibly repetitive and and really would be best suited to be done in an automated process by a, a tool uh, instead of a human. So uh, built into what we do is the ability to do complete bulk configuration changes. Uh, you can have very advanced changes. You can have simple changes. You can schedule those changes. You can Again, have those changes be checked or authorized by additional users. Everything that is done is audited, so you can run reports to see how those things were done, um, et cetera. So um, again, I'm going to jump quickly back in here. I've got configuration jobs, just like I've got discovery or policy check jobs. I've got config jobs, and I can run very simple config jobs, like uh, I want to change or add a new SNMP community name. I, can, I have a very simple section where I could just write the configs as if I was typing them directly on the command line, but now I want to push them out to one device, or maybe I want to push them out to every device in a group. So I see that, and now suddenly all of those devices are going to get that change. And of course, if your groups are large, then, you know, again, you're saving a tremendous amount of time. You could also use those filters, as I showed earlier, so I could say all of my devices with, uh, you know, this particular iOS version, I want to go make that change, or whatever you want to use. You've got a lot of different filter types, and you can use regular expressions to really hone in on what you want to do, and I can push those changes out. Uh, I can also do uh, more advanced type jobs. So I've got a, a 
an example of a more advanced job, an, uh, uh, an NTP config check job, where instead of having the code written out as if I was typing it in, I've actually got some user input, what should the NTP server be, and then I run a script in the background. It's essentially a, an XML Perl type script and where I read the uh, uh, NTP server that is existing, uh, so I'll show the NTP association, I'll parse it, I'll match it to whether it sees or matches what I've got uh, that the user typed in. If it's good, I leave it. If it's not, I change it. Um, so, And you can build these scripts up to include any kind of logic, if, while, then loops, I can read database variables, meaning I can go check not only against the running config, but I could check against the backup, or I could check against an external data source to see what the configuration is, and then use that to essentially change my script or do something. It's a very, very advanced feature of the product. It's used for both uh, initial provisioning, uh, sort of day zero, day one rollouts, as well as obviously making changes to existing systems. Uh, the template, the, the capability of running a template or a snippet-based uh, configuration uh, update is a really, really powerful feature. Probably deserves its entire own webinar, but um, we just want to get you introduced to the capabilities today, and certainly uh, if you have more questions, you can uh, bring them up and uh, we'll, we'll answer them uh, at the end of the show here. Last couple, uh, we have within our NCCM module, we have what we also call VLM or vulnerability and lifecycle management. So this is using that knowledge again of the devices, what it is and what version it's got and what the hardware is and uh, applying essentially a policy but this policy is not for uh, access or security or compliance. It's for vulnerabilities and life cycles. So uh, with particular vendors, you can automatically import any published vulnerabilities. Uh, Cisco, for example, publishes vulnerabilities, and it has lots of detailed information about what device this applies to, what model number, what iOS versions, and even what service may have to be enabled. And because we have all of that information uh, uh, at our fingertips, we can look to see whether or not you've got a system that is applicable to that vulnerability. Um, we can uh, Really, you can even adjust them yourselves and add them uh, on your own. You can test them out. You can certainly uh, use it in a lab environment before a device is pushed out or as new services are being enabled to make sure you're not introducing a vulnerability into the system. Uh, and of course, best practice number 12 is maintaining that vulnerability optimization. So it's not just a one-time check, although you should always do a one-time check, but you then need to follow up with a regularly scheduled check most importantly because sometimes people make config changes, right? Something changes and they may have unknowingly introduced a vulnerability. They've added a service to a, uh, a version of code that now suddenly is exploitable. Um, and so you want to run these scans again very regularly. Uh, as changes are being made, we can see the changes that are made, we can kick off things, uh, and we can inform you of any of those uh, vulnerabilities. We do the same thing with our last best practice, number 13, for lifecycle announcements, end of life, end of sales, end of support, things like that. So again, we take the, uh, the publishings from the various vendors for their lifecycle announcements, we turn those into a policy, and we allow you to run a policy check against them and produce a report that shows I've been, I'm you know, within end of life on six months on these 25 devices or end of support on these other devices, so why am I paying you know, for support? Because, if, of course, most vendors will always accept your support purchase order even if the devices you're paying for support are no longer under support. So this is a great way we've, we've seen many of our customers actually save money by just saying, hey, I'm paying for support on something that's end of, end of support. Um, let's take those off the contract. That in and of itself could probably pay for the service in a very large organization. So um, building all of these things together uh, uh, into your NCCM uh, policies and checks, uh, vulnerability, lifecycle checks, et cetera, really is, uh, I think, a very beneficial uh, tool to have in your armor. Uh, when you've got a big organization, you've got to be able to get control of this stuff, and it really just can't be done manually. 
So with that, Dima, I'll probably turn it back over to you, and we can talk about our white paper and other resources. Thank you very much. That was really insightful and uh, pretty well done. Thank you, John, again. Um, so as John just uh, said, we have a white paper on that topic available as well. He was just talking about, I think it was 13 best practices. We have uh, plenty more. I think there's an altogether of 27 best practices uh, for this area. And um, so you can download that white paper from our website. Uh, the URL is uh, to be found here. Uh, we have some more resources on our website. Um, there is a number of information you can download in terms of webinars, videos, case studies, and so on. So feel free to look around and uh, help yourself in uh, the information you need. Um, in terms of questions, uh, I have answered a number of uh, questions uh, during the presentation. Uh, I think I was able to take care of uh, all of them sufficiently. Um, just a well piece of information because that question came up uh, a couple of times. Uh, yes, the presentation slides for this uh, presentation, they are available. Um, just drop us a short mail at, uh, well, the two email addresses from uh, John and myself are in the chat. Uh, or if you uh, can't remember, then just, just drop us a mail at sales at infosim.com. We can send you those presentation slides. Um, also, uh, I think we've been a little bit too enthusiastic about the EMA report, John. Um, we've been asked if that report is available. Uh, yes, it is available at the uh, EMA website. Um, if you would like some more information, again, just, just drop us uh, a mail. Well. Um, that pretty much uh, covers it. So, John, thank you very much again for your presentation and uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining our session today. As I've mentioned earlier, a uh, recording of this web uh, webinar will be available to all of you tomorrow. You will receive an email with all the details. So, And again, if you have any other question, feel free to contact John, myself, or any other member of the sales staff with Emerson. Thanks again for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone.